This is a video about turntables, and it's a video that would not have been possible without the services of Bai. I've talked about Bai before. Whenever I want something that I could otherwise only get in Japan, I use Bai. Two of the turntables featured in this video came to me by way of Japanese retailers. With the Add to Bai button in my browser, it was easy to get them sent to my Japanese Bai address, then on to me in the United States. I opted for extra packaging and insurance since these were heavy, fragile items. On Japanese auction sites, Bai will even deal with the sellers for you. No Japanese skills necessary. I don't do a lot of advertising on my channel, and when I do, it's for something I believe in and use myself. And for uniquely Japanese products like you see in this video, or even stuff I've just bought for myself, Bai has made the world a lot smaller for me. Check them out. Now I know it's been a while since I've done any kind of video on home audio, and there's a good reason for that. It's just kind of hard to get a point across about audio when you can't hear what I'm hearing. That's especially true on YouTube, where Content ID will end up with a video taken down for even including a five-second snippet of a copyrighted song. So I'm going to do my best here, and who knows, maybe even the sounds of traffic outside my new apartment will help mask the, uh, the music and fool YouTube's Content ID. So I only do videos about audio when I personally want to try something out. Well, that's true today. As some of you may know, for a long time now, I've been using a Sony PSLX3 turntable from 1982, sort of the very end for the golden age of turntables, just before CD took off. I love my PSLX3, but it is getting old and it's starting to show it, and with the vinyl revival now in full swing and so many new mid-range turntables on the market, I started to wonder if any of these could really equal the performance of a half-decent turntable from the past. In other words, if you were to join the Vinyl Revival yourself, should you hop on eBay and look for a vintage model from back when turntables were just how we all listened to music, or should you keep it simple and buy a new one? In years past, the answer to me would have been obvious. Go vintage. Vintage turntables almost always had better features and specs at any given price point, whether you're comparing original MSRP or what you'd have to pay today. That's because of both economies of scale back in the day, along with R&D budgets that were slashed over time as vinyl fell out of favor. So new turntables just weren't as good. The hassles inherent in buying used equipment were just a bit of fluff you had to deal with on your way to the best audio experience you could get for the money. But recently it seems like there's been an uptick in quality among modern turntables, as the revival shows some staying power. I touched upon this a little bit in a video I did a couple of years ago, but there are even more and better current models out there from both old school manufacturers like Denon and Sony, as well as relative newcomers like Project and Fluence. So I decided to try out both a couple of new models that I've had my eye on, along with an older turntable that I think you may have heard of, and of course compare them all to my current Sony PSLX3. This is sort of a baseline mid-range turntable of its era, so it's a good point of comparison. Along the way, I hope to settle the question of whether you get more for your money buying vintage or modern. The other contenders I settled on were the Fluence RT82, the Denon DP300F, and the venerable Techniques SL1200. These choices weren't random. The SL1200 is a classic, well-known design that's always had great specs and was never intended only as a DJ turntable. So let's see how well it works for home use. The RT82 is one of the very few new turntables on the market, along with its sister tables, the RT83 through 85, that has a speed-controlled motor similar to the systems in the PSLX3, SL1200, and many other older turntables. The DP300F is a fully automatic turntable with that late 70s, early 80s look that I love about my PSLX3. It could be a direct replacement. I plan to rank each of these models in a few different areas. Performance, look and feel, and value. So let's just get into it, and as we go along I'll also talk briefly about what you might think is the most important criteria, sound. Turntable sound is, for the most part, bullshit. That's once you get to a certain level, of course. I'm not talking about toys designed to look like a suitcase. All the so-called audiophiles are either switching off or jumping down to the comment section right now, but I used to sell these things to you guys back in the day. A lot of what's assumed about turntable sound originally came from guys like me trying to sell you the most expensive stuff in the store. Consider this the confession of an electronics salesman. We lied to you, and so did the manufacturers in their marketing materials. 
For example, here's the current Techniques website talking about how they finally solved the issue of cogging with the new SL1200GR motor. Cogging is a kind of jerkiness to the motion of a motor as it spins, and it's a bad thing in a turntable. Well, here's Sony making the exact same claim in 1982. They can't both be telling the truth. Either Techniques solved a problem that no longer exists, or Sony lied about solving it in the first place. There is a third option, too, that cogging was never really a problem, because a half-decent motor doesn't cog, and the platter will dampen any cogging it does do. Maybe both Sony and Techniques are just selling snake oil. This kind of thing is the norm in electronics, and especially with turntables, which, unlike devices that produce sound made from ones and zeros, seem to operate on a kind of magic. So manufacturers do just lie, and people believe those lies. Now, this is really a can of worms that's a whole video in itself, as you can see by my comment section. And I'm not going to spend that much time talking about it. But about 90% of a turntable sound comes from its cartridge. That's what takes the physical groove in a record and converts it into an electrical signal that we eventually hear as sound. Cartridges are, with a few exceptions that aren't relevant to this test, interchangeable between turntables. So if you want one turntable to sound like another, just change the cartridge. Now there is that other 10%. Most of that's the effect of different kinds of noise. Turntable makers used to spend a ton of money trying to minimize noise. That's where things like low-mass tone arms or different types of tone arm material came from, as well as more advanced motors, heavier, better damped platters, purer electrical signal paths, and even more advanced feet. The sound coming from a turntable is a very low-level electrical signal, so any little bit of vibration from anywhere will be amplified in that signal. Noise is the arch enemy of vinyl. The only other thing that affects sound in any noticeable way is speed variations, and for me, this is a real pet peeve. This is directly measurable as wow and flutter, and it is annoying if it's audible, which it usually is at somewhere around 0.1 to 0.2%. Unfortunately, many turntables these days don't even do that well. Whatever remains of a turntable sound isn't enough of a factor to even worry about. So what you want, as far as sound goes, is to look for a turntable that can accept the cartridge you want, and that has stable speeds and low noise. That's really it. Of course, vinyl is analog and it degrades over time, so you need to buy a turntable that protects your records, too. This isn't as hard as it sounds. Most new turntables over $100 or so will do this just fine. I do plan to take a few other objective measurements for comparison's sake, and of course do an informal listening test, mostly for my own amusement. Keep in mind the measurements are for comparison between these four turntables in this specific test. Don't take them as absolutes or go comparing them to other videos. I've used original cartridges when possible, but I've also switched out an Audio-Technica 120EB between a couple of tables, just to put my money where my mouth is on the cartridge being 90% of a turntable's sound. This is a well-respected mid-range cartridge that doesn't cost a lot and that I like the sound of. For the objective tests, I've measured speed, wow and flutter, and rumble using the Analog Test LP, a modern test record that's pressed to high standards. There's always going to be some wow and flutter generated by the record itself, since no record is 100% perfect, but this one is definitely good enough for comparison's sake. I'm recording everything using my 1971 Sony TA1010 integrated amplifier as a preamp. This component has been restored and upgraded with new caps and transistors, and it sounds great. As good or better than any modern phono preamp. Then I've got a simple USB analog to digital converter going to my laptop and recording into Audacity. In every case, I ran the tests at least twice to repeat the results. I admit that it surprised me that even tiny differences between turntables were consistently repeatable, so all the results you see here have been double or triple checked. I've also weighed each turntable and their platters. This is kind of a brute force dumb way of measuring any audio component's quality, but it does serve a purpose in a turntable. More mass generally means better dampening and less noise, as well as just more expensive materials all around. Keep in mind that all of these have been set up according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Everything has been broken in for at least a few dozen hours, and I've aligned the cartridges to the bare-walled standard. Yeah, this video took me a while. <laughs> You may be surprised to learn that by most objective measures, all the turntables in this test performed similarly. Wow and Flutter ranged from 0.05% on the PSLX3 to 0.07% on the SL1200 and DP300F. 
The RT82 was right in the middle at 0.06%. And yes, that is the right number for the SL1200. I know it's worse than spec, as is the result for the PSLX3. I even reran the test after cleaning and oiling the spindle. Same result. The DP300F and RT82 both performed better than spec, and probably not coincidentally, those are the two new turntables in this test. Turntables do tend to drift out of spec over time, which is definitely something to think about when buying old versus new. I will say that the wow and flutter on both the direct drive PSLX3 and SL1200 was more stable than the two new belt-driven turntables. The average was similar between all four, but the fluctuations were higher on the belt-driven models. All of the models here had average speeds acceptably close to the standard 33 and a third RPM, although the Sony's was maybe on the edge of being too fast. Its 3161 MHz playback of the 3150 MHz test tone equates to a speed of 33.45 RPM. It's so solid at that speed, though, that I didn't even notice it was fast until I did this comparison, and I'd actually prefer it to the DP300F's wider and sometimes audible speed fluctuations. There's no speed adjustment procedure listed anywhere for the PSLX3, including the service manual, so it is what it is. It was probably set to that speed at the factory, and it's been playing it ever since. It's confident at that speed. The DP300F is the only turntable here without any kind of speed control, and you can see that while its average speed was reasonably close to reference, it fluctuated more than the others. As I said, I could hear this sometimes. It just feels like the music's dragging a bit occasionally. It wouldn't surprise me if this is how most modern turntables perform, since the DP300F is hardly alone in its lack of speed control. There are plenty of reviews of other modern turntables out there that mention speed fluctuations as an issue. I mean, this is something turntable makers knew about and fixed 50 years ago. I don't know why we're going through this all again. You need a speed regulator in there. There was a tight grouping too in low frequency noise, aka rumble, and it's not going to be audible on any of them. Rumble is like black level on a TV though. It affects the whole picture, not just a few specific frequencies so you still want measurements as low as possible. Keep in mind as you look at these charts that the scale on them is different. Don't just judge by the pictures. You might have to view in full screen to see the actual numbers. Audacity doesn't seem to want me to lock the scale for some reason. Objectively speaking, the best performer here was the SL1200 with the Audio-Technica 120 EB cartridge, which peaks at negative 77 dB at 56 Hz. It was pretty closely followed by the DP300F at negative 71 dB at 28 Hz, and the Fluence at negative 70.5 dB at 18 Hz, or about negative 73 dB at 77 Hz in the theoretically audible range. The Sony peaks at negative 67 dB at 59 Hz. What this should tell you is that belt drive motors have no inherent advantage over direct drive in terms of low frequency noise, which is usually where that debate begins and ends. Keep in mind that these peaks are all in negative dB, which means humans couldn't hear any of this noise. And humans also can't hear anything below 20 Hz, which is why I mentioned that the RT82's real peak is actually slightly lower than the top peak you see on the chart. These are all good results. A really noisy turntable can color the sound a bit, even if you can't hear the noise itself. But all of these are pretty quiet turntables. I'll just add to the end of this section that the Fluence and Techniques are the only models here with adjustable feet. Ideally, you want your platter completely level so the stylus puts equal pressure on both sides of the groove. You can do that without adjustable feet, but you just have to do something ugly like sticking a bunch of felt pads underneath a foot or two. And that's just not cool. Now, despite everything I just said, most people today buy turntables for a different reason than we used to. I know there are some real analog sound diehards out there, but I don't know too many people who will earnestly argue that vinyl really sounds better than uncompressed digital, even CD in most cases. Even on the best turntable, there are still going to be pops and crackles, worn grooves, worn styli, low dynamic range, and the list goes on. There are reasons why we switched to CD. Vinyl can sound great, don't get me wrong, especially with many 60s and 70s recordings before engineers started brickwalling everything. And my sense is that this is actually what a lot of people are reacting to if they do claim vinyl sounds better than digital. It's probably more that they're buying a lot of older recordings on vinyl, which were just mastered better, because engineers weren't assuming we were listening in cars or on crappy earbuds. But I still think the reason most people like vinyl nowadays is feel. 
Vinyl is a tactile medium. They're big discs. They come with big artwork. You can't just throw them around. You have to handle them a certain way. There's a certain satisfaction just putting a record on a record player and putting the needle down in the groove. Some record players accentuate that feeling. Others don't. There is certainly no shame in buying a turntable if you just like the way it looks or feels. Most people are not buying records because they have the best sound. If you want the best sound, just buy some Blu-ray audio discs. The best sounding stuff that I have is on Blu-ray audio disc. But records, yeah, it's a feel thing. Now, that said, there is a minimum standard I have when it comes to turntable quality, and all of the models in this test pass that standard. I want an adjustable tone arm, the ability to accept standard cartridges and align and balance them properly, and frankly, I want the look and feel of a proper stereo component. I encourage all of you to look for these same minimum standards. They really are a very low bar, but one that will almost guarantee decent quality all around. No suitcase turntables or changers with their 8 grams of tracking force here. And yes, that will wear down your records. In look and feel, I'd call it a tie between the Fluence RT82 and Technique's SL1200, even though they really couldn't be more different. The Fluence is a somewhat stout, chunky, retro-themed wood-look turntable. Though no, it's not solid wood Fluence, and you should stop saying it is. While the Technique's is a behemoth, an industrial strength metal and rubber, yes I said rubber, turntable that could literally crush all the rest of these just under its own weight. Its platter weighs three times as much as most of the others, and its total weight almost doubles the lightest in the test. It's a tank. The Fluence feels substantial enough, but its real joy just comes from its design and aesthetic, which is a bit more nostalgic than the sleek lines most modern turntables are going for. If the SL1200 is the M1A1 tank of turntables, the RT82 is a Buick Roadmaster estate. The Sony and Denon both look modern and classy, and I like them too. But the Fluence is just something different from the trendy postmodern look, while the Techniques is just in another class of build quality. It's really even overkill for home use, but I always say if anything's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. And lastly, the real question to be settled here is one of value. What's a good turntable for your money? And do you get more for your hard-earned shrewd bucks from something new or something vintage? For that reason, I'm trying to compare mid-range turntables of the approximate same price range, although there's obviously some variation here. But I think we've got enough to go on to come to some good conclusions about where you should put your ducats. I'll run through the prices I paid for all of these on the screen as I talk here, but one thing I've learned is that you will pretty much never only have to pay the price of the turntable when you buy used. These things have a lot of moving parts, a lot of wear items, and a lot of stuff on them that's really easy to break. The two used turntables in this test both arrived with broken and missing parts. I paid $75 for my PSLX3, but I ended up about $200 all in once I replaced the stylus, head shell, 45 adapter, and the two dumb little record guides at the back. It's still not as good as new. One seemingly universal issue with older turntables is that the damping fluid slowly evaporates, meaning instead of the needle doing a gentle glide onto your record, it drops like a stone. This is fixable, but it's a pain in the butt to access the reservoir on some turntables. The SL1200 was a relative bargain at about 300 US dollars. They go for up to $1,000 on US sites, but then I had to ship it from Japan, and when it arrived, both the dust cover and tone arm clamp were busted. No problem, the Bai insurance paid for those, but it was another couple of things I had to go out and find. I also had to find the hinges for the dust cover, which the previous owner apparently threw away. Yeah, DJs. And I had to install them, which is actually a lot trickier than it sounds and requires disassembling the turntable. Luckily, SL1200s are popular enough that there are parts for them all over the place, and most of them are still in production, as the new G and GR audiophile models use most of the same ones. Parts for these new models will usually fit the older Mark II through Mark Vs. You can tell this is an SL1200GR dust cover because it does not say quartz on it. I'll deal. One nice little bonus of getting a new dust cover is that it can make the entire turntable look brand new. This SL1200 also had no cartridge at all when I bought it, so I'm using the Audio-Technica cartridge with it right now. One quirk of the SL1200 is that while it's the only turntable in this test to have a tone arm height adjustment, 
The correct height for this cartridge, and I suspect most others, is actually below zero on the SL1200. Otherwise, the tracking angle of the stylus is way off. This is why you see me using a cheap felt slip mat as a spacer to raise the height of the record in these clips. I've since replaced that with a better looking acrylic mat that also serves as a nice little accent color. I feel like this is an odd design choice on the part of Techniques though. The 120EB isn't particularly short as cartridges go. There can't be all that many cartridges out there that would give you the right tracking angle on this turntable without raising the record up. Oh, and my SL1200 is also a little low on damping fluid, meaning the needle just crashes into the record unless I manually slow it down. The Fluence RT82 here is going to be $300, and that's going to be out the door with everything you need. I think that's a pretty tremendous value for both the performance and the design of this thing. Design, of course, is subjective, but performance really is not. And this feels like a turntable that's punching above its weight. Uh, it really is with that optical speed control in the motor. I don't know of any other turntable in this price range that offers something like that. I do have some minor quibbles with the RT82. It's a quirky little turntable, what with its three feet instead of four, and its outside belt that really seems to have no reason to be there. Most turntables with outside belts have them there because you need to manually pick up the belt to change speeds, but the RT82 does this with a proper switch. That's good, but then why is the belt still on the outside? It looks a little strange and doesn't fit the retro aesthetic. I admit it kind of annoys me. Also, while I do appreciate the fact that the audio cable is detachable, it just uses standard RCA cables like you once could have bought from your local Radio Shack, I'm a bit concerned about its chintzy little power brick that feels like something you'd get with a Chinese iPhone knockoff. I suppose you can always upgrade this too if you want, as it's also a separate item and just uses a standard jack. Still, these are nitpicks really. This is a very good turntable by even historical standards, and for $300 it is a great value. The Denon DP300F is, and this is going to sound like an extremely backhanded compliment, but it's not as bad as I was expecting based on what I'd read about it both elsewhere and in my own comments on earlier videos. I wanted to try it out as it seemed the closest to a direct replacement for my PSLX3 with its sleek silver look, only available in Japan, and its fully automatic operation. I had no problem using a different cartridge with it, something I've read that others have had issues with, though the included cartridge sounds perfectly fine to me. The performance is about what I expected, if not slightly better. Its average wow and flutter was actually better than spec, but there is more fluctuation within that average, as well as its average speed, than on turntables with some type of speed control. Still, in Japan, this is a $200 turntable, and that's really not a bad price for what you get, though you'll need to pay buy-e to ship it here. The US version, which is only available in black, retails for $330. That's a much tougher sell for me given the existence of the Fluence RT82. But maybe you just can't live without full auto operation. This was a high-end feature back in the late 70s and early 80s, and I do think it's a nice convenience. Denon has now released a new model, the DP400, which may or may not be replacing the DP300F. But oddly, it is not full auto and also has a weird dust cover that looks totally stupid and has to be completely removed while you're actually playing records. That's a deal breaker for me. One other thing about the two Japanese turntables in this test. There are a few Japanese turntables that are made for either 100 or 120 volt operation, but these are not among them. That means I had to buy a step-down transformer, which isn't a huge deal, but it's just something I felt I should point out in case any of my viewers decide to go the Japanese route. If you don't want to do this, you can try looking at a picture of the label on the back of a given SL1200 at least to see if it supports both voltages. Some of them do. The DP300F, unfortunately, as far as I know, is 100 volt only, so you'll always need a transformer. So of these turntables, I think I'm going to keep the Fluence and Techniques. The Denon, while it looks seriously classy in that late 70s kind of way, occasionally just sounds kind of weird with its inconsistent speed. I'll probably also say goodbye to my Sony, too. It's just time. Someone else can give it a good home along with the time and effort I'm no longer willing to. Watch for both of these on eBay. So that's one new and one old, which gets me back to the original question. Is it better to buy new or vintage? Well, I think that for most people, there are now new turntables that equal anything you could get on the used market, given the performance degradation of a 40 to 50 year old turntable, and maybe some fudged specs from those bygone days. 
The Fluence RT82 through 85, at least, give you speed control and everything you'd expect from a real turntable from any era. Now, Fluence is unusual in that they're taking traditional turntable specs and performance seriously, rather than just, I don't know, wrapping their aluminum tone arms in exotic materials and claiming that makes them sound better. So if you care about things you can objectively measure instead of fairy tales and magic spells, make sure you always check the specs on any new turntable you look at. And of course, check the cartridge you plan to use with it too. But if you're a little adventurous and you go in with the mindset of starting a new project, buying a vintage turntable like the SL1200, and despite being back in production, this is a vintage design and used ones can be had for relatively cheap, can get you a fantastic turntable that feels better than anything currently out there at a reasonable price. It can be fun fixing up an old turntable, but it can be maddening too. Not everyone wants that experience, and since these are analog devices, you can pretty much count on any old turntable needing something to bring it back to its original glory, assuming that goal is even within reach. Count on a new stylus at the very least. Although seriously guys, not on my Sony or Denon when I sell them. The Denon is brand new, and I just replaced the Sony stylus. Buy my stuff! Now as I close this video, I'll just say that I compared the things that I think are important in a turntable. So go out and buy one based on the things I said. If you do still want to compare sound, there are many, many cartridge comparison videos on YouTube, and I'll even include a link to one or two in the description below. But that's about it for now. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and some of you found it helpful, and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.